I'm Elliot Gerson uh, from the Aspen Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you all here. Uh, I have been to Kabul, but I sh obviously am not the Afghan ambassador uh, who sends his regrets. Uh, he very much looked forward to being here this afternoon uh, to introduce his colleague, the minister. Uh, but you will not be surprised, uh, given the enormous focus on Afghanistan today, there is a large delegation, including the Afghan foreign minister, uh, meeting with uh, the Holbrook team, and so the ambassador had to be uh, uh, present for that. Uh, but this is something that I know he looked forward to uh, very much. Uh, we obviously read and hear a great deal about Afghanistan uh, and intensely, frankly, over the last few weeks, and I think that will continue. Um, Sadly, we usually only hear things that are very, very challenging and just how uh, uh, difficult the task is uh, for Afghan development, uh, Afghan uh, uh, political development as well as economic development. Uh, but the fact is that there are some very exciting things going on. Uh, we also tend to hear things almost entirely from a Kabul perspective and what one hears about rural Afghanistan tends to be among the most depressing reports we get. We get. But again, I think that is more a, a product of the limited access the press has to some <coughs> of the things that are going on that are uh, extraordinarily encouraging and indeed a model, uh, not just for Afghanistan, but indeed for rural development in many other parts of the world. Uh, Minister Mohammad Hassan Zia uh, is our guest today. He was born in Kabul. He went to high school in Kabul. Uh, he was educated in England, his bachelor's and master's degrees in England. Uh, he has written extensively, uh, and he has a career uh, that began in sort of post-conflict Afghanistan in, in, in 1988, working with a series of uh, humanitarian and post-conflict programs, including some particularly associated with the Norwegians and the Germans. A very distinguished uh, record there. Uh, he first joined uh, the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development as an advisor in 2002, and he became uh, the minister of that critical department in 2006. Uh, what he's going to talk to us today is about Afghanistan's National Solidarity Program. And this is, as I alluded before, really a, a a remarkable success story. It's widely regarded uh, across the international community uh, as a success. It is now in, as I'm sure you'll hear, 22,000 villages uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, it is a successful story of rural empowerment, of transparency. Uh, it in, in engages uh, rural Afghans in a way in which they get together to agree on what projects in those villages will have the greatest impact. It imposes rules and procedures of great transparency. And it also, because of the investment that the villagers have in these projects, it provides some fundamental defense against insurgents because of the ownership uh, feeling and, and reality that, that people have in this uh, project, in, in all of these projects. Uh, so it is. Uh, uh, an example of something that's going extraordinarily well and obviously given all we are hearing and how critical it is not just to uh, the future of Afghanistan as a uh, free and successful democracy uh, but uh, the broader world as well. Senator Levin as one example is someone who has visited some of these programs in rural Afghanistan and came back so impressed that he felt that it actually should be a model for uh, American foreign aid. Uh, extensively and, and not just in Afghanistan. And finally, I just want to introduce Claire Lockhart, who is here somewhere. There she is. Uh, we are delighted here at the Aspen Institute to be able to host things like this, and it's because of the program, uh, the Market Building Initiative, uh, headed by Ashraf Ghani and Claire Lockhart, uh, that's been here now for a number of months and is, is focused on what are the essential uh, elements of creating a functioning, transparent, non-corrupt market system 
uh, as a, s a central underpinning of, uh, of, of a functioning and successful democracy. So with that, uh, uh, Minister Asanzia, uh, I, we are delighted to have you here. We understand you'll make some remarks, uh, sh show uh, a video. Uh, then I hope we will engage in an active conversation. And I should mention that for those of you who passed the refreshments on your way in, they're really in designed for a reception after his remarks. So the conversation will continue uh, once, we, uh, once we move out of this room. Minister. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Alias and the uh, Aspen Institute for uh, organizing this meeting for me. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And I would like to also thank you for coming to the meeting, taking your time. And I promise that I will be brief so that I I don't uh, <coughs> uh, exhaust your energy to, at the end of the day here today. And what I will speak about is uh, very briefly the legacy of Taliban to set the scene and then talk about the realities of rural Afghanistan and then briefly we speak about the National Solidarity Program methodology and its achievements. <coughs> and then we will watch uh, a brief video, <coughs> 10 minutes video on the National Solidarity Program. And then we'll be honored to answer any questions you may have. Uh, in 2002, What we inherited from Taliban was a failed state, literally a f disintegrated state institutions. We did not have anything left to build upon. We started to building the Institute of States from literally by putting bricks on the top of bricks from scratch, from minus zero. In the whole of Afghanistan, we did not have a smallest unit of army of a, a company of 10 soldiers, 10 uniformed and disciplined and equipped and armed soldiers in the whole of the country. We did not inherit one police station in the whole of the country which had uh, 10 police officers armed and equipped and uniformed. The coverage of our population to the health services was only 15%. 15% of the Afghanistan's population had access to a degree of health services. Education was literally, you know, come to a standstill. Girls' education was not non-existent and so on and so forth. As a result of 30 years of war, poverty became widespread, became the main feature of life in Afghanistan. Social, dis social cohesion, which used to be very strong in our society, was also severely damaged as a result of <coughs> war, separation, eight mil more than eight million people left for a very long period, almost two decades, two and a half decades, in the refugee camps in Iran and Pakistan, and uh, some people found their way to the West. And also we had large number of internally displaced people. People were divided among uh, uh, political lines in the villages. Warlordism was very prevalent all over the country. And the most uh, 
Now the worst effect of 30 years of war in Afghanistan has been a disconnect between the people and the government. There, a gap always existed between the people and the government in Afghanistan. But 30 years of war, which led to the disintegration of the state institutions, and uh, <coughs> provided for total disconnect. So the government literally disappeared from rural Afghanistan. So in, in, in the year 2002, people of Afghanistan and also the international community found themselves surrounded by hundreds and thousands of priorities. So we had to prioritize, even today, we have to prioritize among our priorities. Even today, is seven years on, <coughs> this is the challenge. The importance of, of rural Afghanistan and the development jargon there is a saying that if you don't have a strong countryside, you don't have a country. This is very much true in the, under, in the case of Afghanistan. It is the countryside which inhabits 80% of the population. It's the countryside which carries the largest burden of poverty, deprivation. And it is the countryside which is close to the vicinity of, of insurgency. It is also the countryside which has the potential for security, which has the potential for, for economic development in the country, because our, our economy is based on agriculture, and there, where is agriculture? It's in the countryside. And it is this, the, today it is the countryside which is causing the trouble for the economy, for the insecurity. The poppy is cultivated uh, uh, in several places. The lessons that we have to learn from the, from the history is that the Russians or the then Soviet Union tried to hold their grip on, on cities and they lost the war. There we have these, these realities of the rural Afghanistan, 80% of the population suffering uh, and all, all, of, all of the rest, and the, the potential for economic uh, debility, uh, economic development and stability. Uh, and we have to we have to learn some some hard lessons. Uh, what we have experienced over the last uh, seven years in Afghanistan is a consistent sense of urgency. Consistent sense of urgency to get the problems fixed quickly. We have to live in a real world. There is no silver bullet. There is no magic solution. We are talking about, we are talking and working in a country which is totally shattered by 30 years of war. Nothing was left in the, in the form of a state institution. When I joined the government, I had to, in July 2002, I had to bring, borrow a computer from my former employer, a desk, chair, printer, and even some, some uh, stationery. Nothing was left in the, for us to come and start immediately. The biggest challenge in post-Taliban was how to reconnect people with the government. Because total disconnect during 30 years of war and separation and how to reconnect. And the second challenge was 
how to promote social cohesion. And here we have embarked on the, on the implementation of National Solidarity Program. For the first time in the history, the government have literally delegated the decision-making power and authority to the men and women and the, at the grassroots level. The government took one step, one small step toward the people and people started to run towards the government. This is the manifestation of the determination of people of Afghanistan that they want to re-own this soil, this land, and they want to live in this country and they want to build this country but provided an opportunity is given to them. What we have, what we have experienced in the last uh, four years of working in rural Afghanistan has been, the, how, what are the factors that uh, contribute very strongly to the development of uh, relationship between the people and the state is the government ownership of the development and security process. This is what makes the government become visible. This, make, uh, what, what, uh, this is what makes the government to, to be seen, to be working and serving and fulfilling its basic responsibility. Unfortunately, large amounts of development funding is channeled through the parallel structures, which further decapacitate the government, because the government of Afghanistan is not able to compete in the job market and attract uh, qualified people to work for the government. So parallel structure that the most immediate damage, the most immediate damage is decapacitation of the state institutions and second, damaging the credibility and legitimacy of the government because a gap is created, the government is not resourced, the government is not uh, uh, fully equipped and manned uh, to deliver services, and then this gap is filled through parallel structures, through NGOs. Here we have a dilemma. Nowhere in the world we can find a prosperous country with weak government. NGOs, international organizations are not substitute to the government. The reasons you have, or you used to have a strong economy here, it was a past tense. Was uh, the capacity and the strength of your state institutions. But there in Afghanistan, there is a sense of urgency, get things done urgently, and we build things and go, and the people will be happier. <coughs> in Afghanistan, through the National Solidarity Program, uh, we made it possible for the first time for the female population for women to, to become an active member of the decision-making uh, bodies in their villages. For the first time, we made it mandatory, a government program made it mandatory that women must participate in the election and must be part of the decision-making. Clara members, I have a witness here. <laughs> Uh, in, in 2003, when we were designing the National Solidarity Program and we were consulting with international organizations, they were warning us against three decisions. One decision w of the government was mandatory participation of the women. The second decision was direct transfer of block grant to the communities. And the third decision was the election. The NGOs were telling us that you are preparing for another revolution in your country. 
another social up upheaval will happen because your country is a, is a conservative society and uh, how can you expect that people will accept uh, female participation in the election and the decision making and f women become members of the council. How can you believe that while this country is full of warlords, the money you deliver to the bank account of these communities are not subject to elite capture? How can you trust in the results of the election? The election will become subject to the elite capture and then once if a warlord is elected or warlords are elected in the in the councils then you have to respect the results and against all odds all uh, people of afghanistan and people in rural afghanistan have embraced this this requirements the National Solidarity Program is not rejected in any of the 22,000 villages because that this is a new model, this is against our uh, social tribal fabric. We don't want election. We don't want our women to participate. There is, <coughs> in contrast, there is a, a demand, a strong demand Two weeks ago, I had a, an interview with BBC uh, dairy program in Kabul, and the BBC correspondent were, was talking on the phone from a village in the province of Khost, which is seen as the most conservative tribal uh, province. And there, he spoke with, with, uh, with a community where, to which NSP was not ruled out, and the people had told them that if the government don't uh, roll out in SP in our village, we will not take part in the election. They didn't say that if the government um, don't con reconstruct our, our schools or don't uh, pave our roads or, uh, or bring this or that to us, we will not take in the, in part in the election. But they said that we need in SP, we want in SP. This is the manifestation of the desire of the people of Afghanistan to participate and the, this is the, the endorsement and acceptance of, of, of democracy. Uh, NSP by all accounts have proved to be a corruption free, free program. No space for corruption to take place. And the secret is the so social fabric of Afghan villages. People live in the same village for generations. And when they are given the opportunity, a genuine opportunity to decide for themselves, they, they decided and they brought their best people to, who, who were enjoying the trust and who had a father name. This is a, an expression that we use in Afghanistan, people with a father name. And, uh, and because they knew each other and the chances of, of mishandling the money becomes minimized. And even if there were attempts of mishandling, villagers reported to us immediately. Here is NSP is the vehicle to deliver development in the places, in the villages, in the provinces where no other agency uh, is able to work. In the provinces of Host, Paktika, Kandahar, and Helmand, the Nuruzlan, and Farah, the only development program which is functioning, which is reaching out people, is the National Solidarity Program. In the province of Kandahar, we are in this piece operating in more than 600 villages. And the same goes for the province of Helmand, which is becoming so difficult. Uh, so far, we have, uh, with the help of the, of the people, we have uh, started the implementation of 46,000 community development projects through the disbursement of $560 million to the community's block grant. For the first time, for majority of these council members, 
is the first time that they enter a bank in their life because the money is transferred to their to a bank account uh, and at the provincial level. This is the experience. This is the, <coughs> the achievements that the people of Afghanistan have. Let me just briefly, very briefly, touch upon other, uh, other positive and strong side effects of the program. As a result of the NSP process, we were able to maintain social justice and the delivery of development. This is the only program which could equitably reach out all provinces. It is extremely critical to get development, reach out to the people today under current circumstances, because if it hasn't been for the delivery and reaching out of the National Solidarity Program to the villages all across Afghanistan, we would have faced instability also in the north and central provinces of the country. The value of uh, social justice also ensured that the, at, the, at the village level by giving people equal right and opportunity to participate. Majority of our council members do not come from rich background, do not come from tribal and traditional leadership background. and also equitable benefit of the development priority because the community has to agree upon their development priorities. It is not that the two, three people, two and three influential people decide what, what project to implement. The value of transparency. A number of things are unknown to everyone in a community where the NSP is operating. They know who are their council members because they have to participate in the election and they vote for them. They know what are their priority projects, development priorities, because they debate to agree, to come to an agreement on these development priorities. And they also know how much is the, the block grant entitlement because nothing is kept secret. They, they, they know who are the executive members of their council who have access to, to the money. And the, as a result, we, uh, a spontaneous process of social audit is started in the villages. People go and ask and want to see the, the receipts and the accounts. Maybe I'm a minister, I, when I travel to these in the speak communities, I always find a piece of a tree a sheet of paper on the wall in which the accounts and expenditures are, are registered. This is what I have seen, but maybe if someone else goes, they may, they may not see this. Uh, the, another very important and critical positive side effect is the promotion of sense of ownership. Because never in the history there was the sense of ownership. The reason for this widespread destruction of the infrastructure in Afghanistan was not so much of carpeted bombing by the then Soviet Union. It was also the deliberate action of the the the, 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 the warring parties. But here in Afghanistan today, in the height of the Taliban insurgency and in, in repression, the Taliban have not been able to destroy one in its peak project all over the country. And then until 2006, Taliban destroyed more than 160 schools in the insecure areas. And none of these schools were constructed by the National Solidarity Program. I can go on and on and give examples that I promised to, to be brief. So, and the, the job is 
and not fully achieved. We have uh, 13,000 villages left to be covered by the program. We have given uh, ourselves a, uh, a timeline of uh, three years. There is, of course, a budgetary requirement of the program that has to be met. One another aspect of the program that I would like to, to mention before I end my 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 speak to <coughs> is the the degree of the mobilization that have taken place in our communities today the cdcs are partnering with the world food program for the implementation and distribution of the relief assistance and implementation of thousands of food for work projects last year we had a severe drought and throughout the year, throughout the summer, we implemented more than 30,000 food for work projects, but all of them through, uh, through the CDC's community development councils. This is because, the, because of the nature of these, these institutions, their representatives. And their representative nest made them responsible. And the, the, the sense of responsibility felt on the part of the, this community development councils made them responsive. They go and knock the doors of agencies. Even they come from, I never expected to see people from the remote districts of Badakhshan and Kabul. But they are on regular missions to Kabul to knock the doors of, of, uh, of government ministries and, and that of ourselves and ask for, for for more development assistance. So, to conclude, the, the achievement of National Solidarity Program demonstrates one thing for me. It is the desire and the determination of people to contribute and to participate. I didn't mention community contribution. Community, there is a 10% requirement of community to, towards the cost of the project. But as a result of the keen interest and the momentum which is created in, in our society, these, these community contributions have gone up spontaneously without any official demand to 20%. In a lot of cases, communities spontaneously without us organizing them get together five villages, 10 villages, uh, to pull in their resources to implement the bigger intercommunal projects. And one of the recent cases that I heard from the province of Herat, community contribution for a project for implementation, for electrification of a city, uh, of the, the village, was 200% cash money coming out of people's pocket. We provided them $60,000 and they added $120,000 as their own contribution to electrify their village. So I, I stop here, I thank you very much. And uh, if you're not too tired, let's uh, take another five minutes to watch the video and take a your <laughs>
Solidarity Program, building on success. The National Solidarity Program, NSP in short, is the government's flagship community empowerment development program. It is one of the most effective vehicles throughout which the human, social, economic dimensions of poverty are being addressed in rural Afghanistan. NSP is building on a national network of self-governing communities across the country, communities who have the freedom to choose their representatives and freedom to choose how best to deal with their collective needs. When the program was launched in 2002, President Karzai showed his full support. So the need for a state program that could provide peace came in. The Afghanistan had to be the partner. I was a new Sui Khatma, I was a Sui Jar Hawana, the Kazakh, a state for the country. The need for a state program, the American was a part of the Kazuari, the Port Akal, Zerudu. Since the program started five years ago, over 20,500 communities have elected their Community Development Councils, or CDCs. Today, there are elected councils functioning in 346 districts across every province of the country. CDCs were formally recognized in November 2006 through the passage of the CDC bylaw by the President of Afghanistan. Every community is entitled to up to 60,000 US dollars as a block grant which can be used only for projects that have been prioritized in community development plans and benefit the entire community. CDCs are trained in managing these funds and members of the community are kept fully informed on how the money is being spent. CDCs are one of the most cost-effective service providers in rural Afghanistan today. All communities must contribute at least 10% of the cost of the projects themselves. This ensures accountability, transparency, as well as ownership and sustainability of the CDC projects. Development plans mirror the priorities of the rural communities. NSP priority projects are focused on educating youth by fixing schools or building new ones, and by building and rehabilitating infrastructure. NSP projects have given 7.6 million people in rural Afghanistan access to safe drinking water and sanitation. 4.4 million people now have access to electricity, many for the first time in history. NSP has increased the yield of cereals and vegetables for over 851,600 farming families through small-scale irrigation projects, and NSP has provided 13,270 kilometers of rural roads to the more than 25% of villages which don't have year-round road access. NSP is not just a development program. Through the promotion of participatory governance, NSP is shaping communities based on security, justice, transparency, unity, and solidarity. NSP is helping to restore the social fabric that was ripped apart through years of war and strife. It nurtures new ways of decision-making for communities. NSP's goal is to attempt to cover 100% of all rural communities in Afghanistan. It still needs to facilitate the election of many new CDCs in remaining districts of the country. To do this, NSP will require continued support from donors, the government of Afghanistan, and the Afghan people. What has been accomplished over the last five years through NSP 
is just the beginning of a journey towards economic growth and poverty reduction. The government is committed to taking this journey with its people. NSP has been designed for just this purpose, to give the poor a head start in their struggle to overcome poverty and become prosperous. The National Solidarity Programme is building on success and giving the Afghan people hope for the future. I was there as a reporting officer with the British Army that was there and on our many foot patrols and horse patrols and vehicle patrols through the five northern provinces. We saw in every village the children being sent out to gather fuel every day for their mothers to cook with and pulling up every bush around every village because there were no more trees. While I was there, I did a little research online and began building very rudimentary solar cookers out of cardboard and aluminum foil, and I demonstrated them in some of the villages on our patrols and found people were really very interested in this device that could cook food with sunshine. I retired uh, soon after I came back and have spent the last two years uh, as a volunteer promoting this technology, and I'm in touch with a lot of people in Afghanistan. I know there are very small projects going on in your country. And I was recently contacted by someone in Defense Department who's expressed an interest in learning more about it. I believe very strongly that this is an ideal project for the NSP, and certainly your country is blessed with sunshine, and you have uh, a serious uh, shortage of fuel for cooking everywhere in the country. And I urge you to consider supporting this project uh, with the folks who are already there in Afghanistan, these very small groups. It's being used already, I know, in Bamiyan and in Balkh. And even on a day like today, where the sun is shining but it's very cold, you can still boil, boil water, cook rice, cook meat with a parabolic solar cooker. So it's not really a question. I would like to encourage you to consider that technology that could change the lives of so many people. Uh, hi, my name is Jack Bell, and um, one of the questions I have is what is the state of funding of the National Solidarity Program for this year, and what is the outlook for future years in terms of the sources of funding and the amounts of funding? Uh, for this year, the, uh, our budget requirement is in the range of $300 million. Because uh, because of the the high demand and the urgency for expanding the pro pro program to rural villages, uh, we rolled out the program, but the program was never fully funded on annual basis. Uh, the the prospect of funding for the program. Uh, is uh, from three European donors and also through, sorry, through the World Bank <laughs> is uh, is promising, but it's not meeting all the budgetary requirements of of the program. For us to achieve national coverage, uh, we require uh, an, an around uh, seven hundred ninety million dollars to achieve na 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 uh, national coverage. And uh, because the program have not been able to disperse money to the, to the villages, uh, so it slows the, uh, down the, the, the pace, the pace of the expansion. This has been a problem all along from the beginning of, of the program. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Minister. My name is David Thorpe. My question would be, uh, you mentioned that none of the schools that have been built by NSP have been destroyed by the Taliban. Um, is NSP delivering any kind of other sorts of security things uh, in tangible ways, whether this social cohesion you're talking about, is that sort of uh, reducing the amount of recruitment to the, uh, the Taliban or the insurgency? This is 100% this is the case. This is 100% the case that wherever NSP has operated, it, it decreased the, the level of inst instability uh, in, in, in those villages. But it also depends on, on the ability of our security institutions to protect, provide protection to those people <coughs> in the districts of Panjwai and Sangin and Musakala <coughs> in the province of Helmand and Kandahar. If people are left alone for the repression of Taliban, there is very little that in speak could achieve. But uh, through the promotion of social cohesion, we have uh, definitely reduced the chances of uh, Taliban recruitment. Uh, and uh, to the ranks. Claire? Um, thank you, Minister. And Let's wait for the microphone, Claire. Oh, thank you. I have two questions. One is um, the principles of National Solidarity Program, which are based on community empowerment and empowering individuals to take decisions, seem to be quite in line with President Obama's philosophy and his own election campaign. So my first question is, will you be having discussions with the new administration while you're here on the potential of partnership on this program going forward? My second question is, I know you have another range of programs in your ministry, including microfinance and rural enterprise. And since we're at Aspen Institute and focused on the market building initiative, I wonder what, what's your sense of what are the urgent priorities to get the market functioning in Afghanistan and around which type of sectors could productive enterprise be established and jobs be created? Uh, <coughs> let me answer your last question first. Uh, our ministry is, uh, is implementing on, along uh, with the National Solidarity Program a number of other national priority programs. National uh, Rural Access Project, which is focusing on construction of roads, which is Afghanistan. Uh, in Afghanistan, a lot of communities are, uh, are cut off because of the train and mountainous uh, <coughs> landscape. The second priority program that we are uh, implementing is the National Erebus Development Pro Program. It's the National Erebus Development Program is uh, working at the district level bringing up the CDCs one level higher and uh, organize them in the form of uh, district development assemblies and, uh <coughs> and then help them, provide them technical assistance uh, for uh, preparation of, uh, of uh, district development uh, uh, plans and uh, also work with them, provide them uh, development funding for the implementation of their priorities, which has been extremely, extremely successful. In the area of uh, economic uh, uh, development, economic activities, our ministry uh, started a national program on microfinance. In the year 2003 and the year 2006, we transformed this program as, a, as an independent, autonomous financial uh, institution. We have established an apex body, which we call MESFA Microfinance Facility for Afghanistan. <coughs> and then under this MESFA, we established uh, 17 microfinance, Afghan microfinance institutions with the help of international NGOs. And now we have these, these bodies working at the village level and then coordinated by, by microfinance. And they have uh, made that, uh, a remarkable uh, uh <coughs> expansion uh, over these years, and uh, they have now uh, provided loans at the doorsteps of the people in the most remote areas of Afghanistan. They have reached out for uh, 425,000 families to provide them with loan for setting up a business and uh, starting a small-scale enterprise. The re re repayment rate 
has consistently been 98%, 95%. And uh, <coughs> what is very encouraging for us in this program, which again is a manifestation of people's will, is the participation of women. S until last year, 77% uh, of the borrowers were women. It, it reduced because in some areas the number of male borrowers has increased, so that has <laughs> affected the percentage. Now it is 65% uh, of the borrowers uh, are women. And the, the fourth program that our uh, ministry is, is preparing to start it as implementation is the promotion of rural enterprise. In Afghanistan, the tragedy, the, the tragic fact is that we, the, the higher, the, the, uh, the farmers increases their agricultural produce, their economy their, uh, doesn't improve uh, <coughs> in accordance with the, the quantity of their, their uh, agricultural produce. It's because when it is the season, everyone brings their products to the market. And the price drops. Uh, what happens that the business mafia purchases these, uh, these commodities, transport it to, to Pakistan, to the other side of the border, and they store our pomegranate, potatoes, onions, which are the, the crops uh, we produce in the autumn in the month of October, November. And then in the month of January, we buy our own uh, crops from, from Pakistan. <coughs> Where the, on the other side of the border, they, they store it in the cold stores, which there in Afghanistan, we don't have these facilities. So this, this, this new program uh, aims to facilitate for the uh, private sector to, to invest on small scale industries. Because the danger is that uh, with with this uh, market economy policy of the government, if we don't focus the development investment in rural Afghanistan, the gap between rich and poor will, will rapidly increase. We are already seeing the signs, the, 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 the signs of this, this, uh, this gap uh, between the rich, uh, rich and poor. And the economy of the country will be controlled by a small, a small minority. So we are providing for people uh, at the village level, at the grassroots level, uh, to, to have access to, uh, to economic development and enable them to add value to their agricultural produce. It's very easy to, to turn the tons and tons of tomato that we are producing in different provinces into tomato ketchup. Can it and then increase it as uh, shelf life. The same thing with all sorts of fruits that we are producing in other provinces. Mr. Minister, can I just follow up on, on Claire's question? Is, is there anything in particular that you feel is especially uh, attractive as a substitute for, for poppies when looking for agriculture and industry that <coughs> could make a difference in the rural areas? That, that has to be an enormous challenge, but a great opportunity, too, if there could be a transfer from what is now, in many parts of the country, by far the most lucrative agricultural product? Um, I believe that we have not uh, come across anywhere in the world as an alternative crop to poppy. There is no alternative crop to poppy. The key is promotion of economic development. The key is creation of employment opportunities for men and women in, at their doorsteps. We should not expect f uh, women from rural Afghanistan to, to come for a, a search of jobs in the, in the urban center. It's not going to happen. They would rather die in their village of hunger but to come and, and find a job in Kabul. This is not happening. And there is a limit how much Kabul can employ or other provincial centers. So we have to create employment at their doorsteps. And the best case scenario, our, our rural population have employment uh, six months a year. 
because of inaccessibility, lack of jobs and all the rest, agriculture has became a subsistence activity. People eat what, uh, during the winter what they grow in the summer because there is no other employment opportunities for them to keep competing. So th this is the program that the Rural Enterprise Program uh, is aiming to create employment opportunities. Poppy production has brought more poverty in Afghanistan, and there is a growing realization of this fact in rural Afghanistan, which we are, which are <coughs> Uh, protected from the repression of Taliban. The reason that cultivation of poppy continues in the province of Helmand and Kandahar because there is very little control of the government and rural areas of these provinces. And the reason that we have uh, reduction in cultivation in the provinces of Jalalabad and uh, Badakhshan, Balkh and other 15 other provinces is because of the control of the government is there and, uh, and the, the persuasion that has taken place, but people expect that this development to also come. So we did our part, responded to you positively, stopped uh, cultivation, but you, you do your part. Any other questions? We have a little time before our reception. A woman in the back. Hi, Lonnie Mullen. I am a visiting scholar here at SAIS, and I teach a course on Afghanistan there too. My question is with regard to monitoring um, of the NSP program, um, in particular the issue of corruption, but also uh, it's one thing to elect women, another to ensure that they actually participate in the process. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what kind of mechanisms you have there and if you have any data, have, have outside groups um, done studies to see that not only are women elected, but they actually participate in the process. Thanks. Uh, the good thing with the, with the National Solidarity Program is, uh, is the division of labor between different actors. We, as a responsible ministry, do not do everything. We have contracted NGOs to do the actual facilitation work uh, at the field level. And then w once they do the job, do the community mobilization, election, and all the rest, then when it comes to, uh, with the implementation of the project and the money, then it is the community who has access to the money who controls the, the financial resources. It's not the same in you or our people. Uh, with, with the empowerment of women, to be honest with you here, we have just laid the foundation, a platform for women to, to believe that they have a right to promote an under, un, understanding that the woman has a right to participate in. And this is the obligation of the, the community to make it possible. But we, have all, we are also seeing very, very successful examples and the NSP communities. What I share with you is anecdote, but it, uh, it shows something as a, as a beginning. In, the, in, the, in a district in the north of Kabul, female members of CDCs from 36 villages lobbied their husbands and brothers to contribute part of their block grants from all of these 36 villages for construction of a 20-bit maternity hospital. And this hospital will be completed in the next two, three, two to three months time and will be, become operational. And we have similar, similar examples. But uh, I cannot claim and I don't want to claim that uh, we have uh, made a major headway in the process of uh, female empowerment. This is what, how much we could do uh, at this stage. Gentleman here. Uh, my name is Paul Fishstein. Thank you very much, Minister Zia. Um, I had a question about the nature of the partnership between the, the government and the NGOs, but also I want to endorse um, what you had 
said before in relation to the opium poppy question and talking about comprehensive development, employment creation, and I, I think this was unsolicited, but um, even wheat, depending on market conditions, if you have functioning markets and if the relative prices change, even wheat can provide an alternative, at least for a while, to opium poppy. Anyway, that's a, a, fr a free comment. Um, it's interesting that two of the programs that are most cited as Afghanistan's most successful programs, uh, the NSP and the health uh, program, are both examples of public-private partnerships, partnerships between the government and NGOs. Can you talk a little bit about any lessons that those relationships might have for other programs or things that programmers um, could keep in mind um, from these successful programs. Thanks. NSP uh, in Afghanistan broke this myth that the uh, government and NGOs uh, cannot work together. NGOs have an enormous potential to complement the efforts of the government. But provided they work within the framework of the, of the government, uh, the development framework of, of the government. Uh, the health program is also another success story of this partnership. But this partnership can only happen if the government control the resources. This can only happen if the government controls the resources. If the NGOs receive independent funding, forget about partnership. This is, this is my experience. We have this uh, 30 NGOs working with us in this successful program. But when it comes to their independent funding, I have no example anywhere in Afghanistan that they have provided block grant to the community. No example anywhere. And the, these, these NGOs are working in the implementation of national solidarity since the, uh, mm, uh, September 2003 in the same communities and one can think that there is so much relationship and trust and confidence between the two that it is much easier for NGOs to deliver development uh, through the uh, community mechanisms, but they don't. So, <coughs> and 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 then uh, the the sense of competition starts with the with the government um, uh, again over over winning the 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 donors resources. Um, I can go on and give tens of examples from Kandahar and Uruzga. <laughs> How, how the partnership doesn't work with the same NGO <coughs> who is implementing national solidarity program in Kandahar. So this mentality is power control over resources issue. We did promise that we would continue the conversation at the reception, but we'll have two more questions if that's all right. First, the gentleman who demonstrated his agility earlier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, was all, it was all in a good cause. Does this one work or do I need the other? Okay. I'm, I'm interested in this idea of spontaneous clustering that's happened between these CDCs. I'm interested in several things, so I'm going to cheat and ask a couple of questions and try to strategically wave them into one so they seem like one question. Um, is there a way in which if those clusters continue to build up that we will build something like a recognizable civil society in Afghanistan? Because we seem to think that we can come into a country and hold national elections or even subnational elections and then that's democracy without building the habits of democracy at a lower level. So I wondered whether building civil society, and even though these villages are isolated from one another, whether they would al this would allow public opinion to develop that would put pressure on incompetent or in corrupt parts of government to clean up their act. Can, can it work from, from that level? The other issue 
the other question that I had is also has to do with bigger projects. It's my understanding that one of the advantages of poppy is that you can grow it with not much water. So that fixing the, the poppy problem will involve major irrigation. How much does NSP's small water projects require a larger project from the government on Afghanistan's water resources on a rebuilding the stuff that was done in a scorched earth fashion to get the water there and also to support the lead time that it would take for people to grow different crops if they have to wait three or four years to get their first tomatoes, pomegranates, et cetera, where they were growing poppy before. So in related sets of questions. Uh, regarding your first question, we are seeing uh, manifestations of the people's will and pressure to defend the interests of their communities and their villages. Because of the nature, the representative nature of, the, of the, these institutions, the community development councils. Taliban were uh, banning a community in the province of Zabul from implementation of their NSP project. And a group of 10 elderly people from this village travels all the way to Quetta to speak with Taliban leadership there. They knew where to find the leadership. And to, to get a permission uh, to, to, to implement their project. This is, you know, the, the, the level of, of interest and defense of, of uh, communities' uh, uh, interest, uh, which has grown as a result of community mobilization. By clustering the CDCs, uh, we, we are developing and strengthening <coughs> this uh, citizen's uh, uh, pressure and citizen's capacity to pressure and demand development and demand accountability uh, from, from the government and from aid programs. Um, the implementation, transparent implementation of this hundred thousands of food for work projects is another case that uh, only this year we delivered 45,000 metric tons of food to the drought affected areas through food for work projects but all of it through the CDCs. We, but we have just laid the foundation it needs further strengthening capacity building uh, further, further organization which we are planning to do in the second phase of National Solidarity Program. Irrigation is, uh, has become a priority area for investment <coughs> for the government of Afghanistan. Our president, our government uh, presented as a priority in the in Paris conference. And Afghanistan has been so generous throughout its history to let its water flow to the neighboring country. We have water flowing towards the east, towards the north, towards the west, and we are taking very little. A, a study showed that Afghanistan is only using 3% of the water which generates in the, within the country. So major investment is required uh, to, <coughs> to develop the irrigation sector to bring more land under cultivation. We have land. We have water, we have human resources to put together uh, water and land and produce food and uh, develop the economy. So the small scale uh, irrigations that we have uh, developed through the National Solidarity Program and other, uh, uh, other programs of the ministry would uh, certainly benefit from increasing the amount of water from the investment in these bigger projects. But what is really what, what has really slowed down this process 
is the country's inability to conduct feasibility study and technical design. We have been requesting time and again the, the donors and the friendly countries to help us in the design of these projects. In the whole of the country, it's a sad reality that we cannot find a team of 20 Afghan engineers, hydrogeologists, to study um, an irrigation or hydroelectricity project in the province of Badakhshan uh, to be built on the Oxus River. For repair of an uh, irrigation dam in the province of Kandahar, I and the president requested Canadians so many times. W we are eventually Canadians sent the team to study the dam, and uh, now the, the project, the repair work will start hopefully in summer. So this is, this is the, the sum of the limitations that we are currently facing. Well, Minister, I'd like to thank you very much and welcome all of you to continue our conversation outdoors. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.